um, faculty who have been hard at work during this pandemic uh, doing great stuff. Um, this will be recorded, so um, just a reminder that, that this will be online in a couple of days. Um, each speaker should have about five to seven minutes to present and then um, make sure to leave a couple minutes for questions. And um, I don't know if we should wait a little bit just to have more people show up. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll start with Dr. Morrison. Is everybody able to hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that helped. Uh, good, and, and everybody's able to see the presentation? Looks good. Yes. Okay. All right, so should I just go ahead and start? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, good. So I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work I've got ongoing. Um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm currently on sabbatical. I've been thinking happy thoughts about causal inference and causal modeling. Um, and what I'm going to present here is um, a big part of what's been occupying my time has been looking at um, software as causal models. And this is building off of a project that I've, I've had ongoing for a while that's kind of morphed into uh, several application areas. Um, so here's the high level picture. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to uh, come up with a way to get it so that computers uh, can better understand the code that they're getting as well as link that code uh, to documents that people write about them. And so the main application here has been trying to come up with an integrated uh, picture of scientific models, the, the models that scientists produce that largely live inside their head, uh, that they write papers about and publish, and occasionally writes uh, code that is supposed to implement those models. And uh, how do we get all that together in a, a single unified representation that allows us to then address questions about how a computer could better understand what that model is and also to help promote communication between scientists as well as uh, doing a better job of really um, making sure that we're being consistent and understanding what's being claimed and being able to de demonstrate that. So the system we've been building is doing, uh, at least this part is focusing on extracting and linking. And uh, what we've done is um, we're, we've got some source code on the left here. It happens to be in Fortran. It's of a scientific model representing uh, an epidemiological model, which all of us are, are unfortunately now probably more familiar with than we'd like to be. On the right-hand side, there's some text. This actually comes from Wikipedia about uh, general epidemiology models. And importantly, there's, there's equations in here, which is also one of the main modalities by which scientists uh, express their scientific uh, models in and expressions of causality. So we've got uh, several pipelines in the system that uh, one of which does program analysis and extracts a data flow representation of the code. Um, this is intended to be language agnostic, so it could be Fortran, Python, C, C++, etc. We then um, do machine reading uh, to extract expressions about concepts and relationships amongst them. And we're able to link these things together so that this representation now, the variable i is no longer just a variable uh, it, you know, identifier in code, but is actually linked to the concept that it's about the infected population. And um, at least in this model, it's the infected part representing the numbers of people who have been infected by some disease. And um, we also are extracting uh, representations of equations and linking those to what's being computed in code. And again, those get linked in this central representation. And finally, we, we do ground these uh, things to existing ontologies, like in this case, it's the scientific variable ontology. So over the last, uh, well, basically the nine last past nine months, prior to that, I was doing a lot of work uh, analyzing um, agronomic models, uh, models of things like evapotranspiration and crop growth and how those connect to weather models. Uh, but now we've been looking at analyzing COVID-19 epidemiological models. Um, 
I'm not going to have time to go into details, but two interesting applications that have come out of this is that we've been able to apply our tool to identify that um, some of you may not know, but uh, the CDC uh, over the last nine months has been bombarded by literally hundreds of people's implementations of models that they say, this does a really good job of predicting. They've got this really big challenge of how do they understand the model well enough to know how to evaluate and, and, and um, compare them. And so uh, we've, our tool has been able to help with looking at say documentation and seeing whether or not what is implemented whether what's expressed in these equations actually is in fact what's implemented. Uh, another thing that this has led to is we've been doing causal analysis of these, the central representation of this, looking at how, what was actually implemented in code and how variables affect other variables. We've been able to, in some cases, identify some fairly subtle bugs about assumptions that were made in models. And so anyway, we're trying to get this uh, framework available and ready for, um, ready for, for modelers to be able to use. And we're, we're uh, interacting with modelers right now. Uh, and uh, again, I've got, I think, at least three funded projects right now that all basically have versions of this kind of an application. So anyway, that's, that's my quick summary. And I'll stop there. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Go ahead, Dr. Leatherall. I think you went first. I was just clapping. Those are the clapping hands, not the oh, clapping okay. <laughs> I was clapping as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Morrison. That was a really, it's kind of amazing the work that you're doing these days. We appreciate knowing about it. Thanks. Okay, well, if we don't have any more, any questions for uh, Dr. Morrison, I uh, just wanted to give a quick Introduction again. Uh, this is the iSchool Faculty Research Blitz, and we are already hearing great research and going in, going to start hearing more. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Dorienzo. Okay. Um... So, um, hey everyone, thanks for uh, listening. Um, so this is gonna be talking, uh, it's gonna be quick, or I'm gonna be talking quickly, uh, but about some work that I've been doing just completely on the side, being teaching faculty, all the research happens at night or on my own time, uh, but some stuff about looking at individual bias um, in police officers in Arizona. Um, so I historically have done a lot of work looking at individualistic behavior, but in animals, um, looking at sort of why one individual would behave differently, um, whether it's because of development or experience or social environment, and what are the consequences for, for decision-making on the individual, on the group, um, on the species, community, so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, coming to the high school and, and just more in general, I've pivoted to sort of larger questions about identifying uh, bias in policing um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so for one, bias is an individual and, um, and group behavior, right? Bias and decision making is inherently um, a behavioral question. Uh, it's also undoubtedly relevant, right? So I started this just more as a way to sort of create data sets and questions that, are, that my students are interested in um, and, and that sort of are topical for them. Um, of course, we don't, you know, we can talk on and on about sort of the issues of police bias that have become um, in the spotlight for the last decade. Um, also, it, my personal experience actually links to this pretty heavily. Um, I probably haven't told many of you, but I actually was a police officer for a year back when I was 21. Uh, my brother's hand gesture is being bleeped out. Um, my opinions are dramatically different uh, compared to what they were then compared to what they are now. Um, and so I need to point this out just because it's not like I don't have a perspective on this, but also that perspective sort of like gives me a lot of insight when I see these data sort of knowing sort of where this bias might arise because, well, I, I worked with these people. Um, so in identifying bias is inherently like this really difficult process when it comes to police work, right? So there's no controlled experiments. Police are, are, are unbelievably against any data collection on them or experimentation on them to understand these things. Reporting is highly spotty and it's not standardized. 
Um, and so, um, you know, what else are you going to do uh, during COVID but have a Facebook argument? Um, so here's a graph that I made um, in response to a person who's still a police officer in the department that I worked at about racism in their department. Um, and so in order to create this graph, which a friend said it looks like racism, the bar graph, looking at how much more they arrest minorities compared to white individuals in that town, um, I had to go through and dig through individual PDFs that sometimes were images, sometimes were missing data, sometimes were, you know, flattened, all these issues. Um, and when I wanted to actually rigorously compare it to the town next door to see if these proportions differed, they have a whole different system and you can't actually compare these data. Um, and this is just two individual towns, right? Um, you oftentimes need to do FOIA requests to get reports and complaints. Um, reporting is done by individual officers, right? So, so the officers that are that are committing actions um, are biased in and of themselves and are oftentimes highly biased in how they view things. And so it's highly subjective. And so even despite all these things working against it, lots of amazing organizations put tons of effort and still discover bias, right? By very boots on the ground sort of work um, to sort of do this, but it's a significant effort. Traffic stop data actually allows someone like me who's doing this just on their own um, to sort of dig into this. Um, so the Stanford Open Policing Project aggregates 200 million traffic stop records. Um, Arizona has 4 million uh, stops on record. There's still these issues with missingness and consistency, like the state patrol, um, which is what I'm going to work on here. It's missing a half million of their stop information. Uh, and then you also have things like where you don't have the violation information for state patrol, uh, but you do have search info, but for Mesa, you don't know why they searched um, and if anything came out of the search, right? So makes still comparisons hard, but you can still do some interesting things. So my two questions are, you know, what is the effect of race on stop outcome, ticket versus warning? Um, and if there is an effect, does it extend to the individual level? Um, the approach is clean data, do some overall analytics, that kind of what I focused on initially, and then some modeling. If I stay and look at the overall state level, what's the percentage of time that an individual gets a ticket versus a warning based on race? Um, these are their codings. What we can see here is just looking at Gil and Graham, uh, we see that um, overall white individuals have a substantially lower rate of getting tickets. Um, basically, every other group is getting tickets at a rate of around 10% more, um, and this is out of, you know, two and a half million stops. Um, and this extends to every actually county that exists in Arizona, right? White individuals are persistently less likely to get a ticket. Um, Simple regression modeling shows that Arizona as a whole, probability of a ticket for a white male, 0.64, probability of basically any other group is around 10% higher um, of getting a ticket. So surprisingly, race actually only explains around 3% of the variation in getting a ticket, um, which is more than most of us would, or lower than most of us would think, right? Um, and the reason is for several reasons, but I think the main one is, is it's not surprising because behavioral is indi like individualistic, right? Like normally it's a few individuals that might be driving this pattern, not every actual officer. So you need to actually dig into individual level effects. So starting again with more of like an analytical approach, here again, I'm still looking at the percentage of time versus warning issues. Um, but then instead officer ID, right? So I'm actually looking at individual officer statistics, troop, state trooper statistics. And you get a graph like this. And so kind of to let me explain this, what I did was I just basically did a, a simple sort of, you know, um, whoever, if they were ticketing non-white groups at greater than 30% rates compared to say white groups, right? Um, so if we look here at these two officers, they're giving white individuals, you know, um, you know tickets at 30% less than, than black people that they're stopping drivers. Um, and then this individual is giving Hispanic drivers um, tickets at 30% greater rate than white drivers, right? So it's really easy to actually pull out individuals out of these data. Um, and, and the sort of depressing side of this is that when you look at out of the 1300 troopers that are here present in this data set, 10 troopers are showing at least a greater than 30% difference um, bias against one not white group. Uh, 63 of these troopers are showing at least a 20% difference and almost 300 or over 300 are showing um, a greater than 10% difference against one, one non-white group. These are very robust in that they're all stopping thousands of individuals because they're state troopers and it's what they do all day. Um, so again, how much ticketing behavior is driven by individual troop troopers? I also then try to dig into this statistically. So using a missed effects model, what I showed is that the vast majority of variation in ticket outcomes is driven actually by officers. So it's individual officers are making very different decisions on sort of how they ticket. Some are very aggressive, some are not. It's actually explaining 60% of the variation. And there's some indications that it's actually driven by individual officers that are biased, right? So these racial effects are actually driven by individual officers. This is kind of detailed, but essentially what, what I'm seeing is when I start accounting for individual officer ID, that actually the magnitude of the effects on several races is dropping. 
Um, and so I, how I am interpreting this and how sort of my, my knowledge modeling is interpreting this is that essentially we took those bias officers and accounted them elsewhere in the, accounted for them elsewhere in the model, and then it reduced the magnitude of effect as a whole. Um, so, so I think this is actually getting at it, but it needs some more modeling. It's getting at the fact that I'm able to start identifying biased officers um, statistically. Um, so conclusion, statewide bias against all non-white categories, very small but significant effect, which is obviously highly problematic. Everyone should have the same likelihood of getting a ticket. Um, strong individual effects, so it's, and it's also very easily easy to identify um, biased officers. So there's no reason why we can't be doing this and, and sort of having flags raised on officers that are sort of you know, giving black drivers tickets at 30% greater rates. And a quarter of the troops are showing this behavior. Modeling is supporting the notion of statistical, um, statistically significant bias in some. Future directions. Okay, um, I'm doing this all on the side, but nonetheless, I still want to do some deeper modeling, right? So additional modeling to more directly get at officer bias uh, within those random effect models, um, as well as more covariates, um, but those require some deeper cleaning. I also need to expand this to use Photom NL um, and Spark because it's just hitting the limits uh, given the sort of size of data and potential interactions. Um, I also want to learn sort of, and I would love to get some feedback on creating just a bias index for officers, right? So using some sort of diversity index to sort of get an idea of sort of officers that are highly variable and how they're ticketing these different groups. I'd also would eventually like to do some sort of open access dashboard, right? So I mean, I think that why this stuff is valuable is to sort of to create public interest and a public viewpoint in terms of what they're funding, basically, how they're actually actively funding bias and policing. Um, and then also what's going on in other areas, for example, Mesa, which shows even more bias um, and more problematic patterns. Um, there's also then with the categorization of unknowns, because all too frequently police officers just say, I don't know the race. Um, and they do this thousands and thousands of times um, as a way to obscure things. Um, so, thank you. Sorry, I hope that wasn't too fast. <laughs> Great, thank you, Dr. Rienzo. Um, do we, do we end up, sorry. Uh, do we have any questions? Hey, Nick, um, is there information enough that you could look at individual officers over time to see if their bias was increasing or decreasing? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's that's one of the next things that it's like one of these things that analysis that I want to do is is looking at time effects. And so, yeah, th there is time. So you can sort of look at some of these effects of um, officers have been shown at nighttime when they can't basically see the race of driver to basically stop and search, or during the daytime when they can see the race of, of drivers, they they up their their searching of minority drivers and stopping. So yes, and then we can also look at time effects too, right? Are police becoming more polarized, which I think they are. How do you account for um, other factors like uh, officer patrol areas or um, some officers being assigned because they speak uh, Spanish better or something like that? Yeah, no, and I think that's, an, that's a good question. Uh, but in theory, this is looking at the probability of a ticket versus a warning. And so, so in theory, you're the, an officer might vary in how likely they are to give a ticket, but they should be ticketing all groups equally, right? So if I was looking you. at raw numbers, I think that would be more of a problem, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Mike? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, really, really excited to see this. Um, just to let you know, there's a, there's a couple of us over in linguistics who are doing a similar project, but with Tucson PD. And so uh -huh. I think it'd be great if we could get together and talk with you sometime. I just wanted to get that out there. Perfect. And that's what I was hoping of this, is to find other people who are mode domain experts that we can work together with. So awesome. Excellent. Good deal. I guess just a side note here, um, if any of the faculty would like to um, share their emails or contact information, um, please do so in the chat, um, only if you want to. All right, well, thank you everyone very much. This was fun. Okay, uh, Dr. Daly, you are up next. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Diana Daly, and I'm gonna talk to you today about the iVoices program. So the iVoices program, or it's a project for now, but I have aspirations to elevate it into a program after the initial three years of funding um, by the Center for University of Education and Scholarship, along with the iSchool and the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. I'm really grateful to have research funded by them and it's teaching centered research, which is a really nice kind of research. I have a teaching position at the university as well um, and in the School of Information. And I have found myself focusing over the last several years, particularly in teaching in large classrooms um, on student stories. I teach about social media and it's pretty impossible to keep up with everything related to social media 
at the pace that that world and landscape develops. And the way that I've managed to keep my teaching relevant has been for years now to integrate student stories into my classroom. And so then I launched the iVoices Student Media Lab project with the understanding that that is an endeavor that's worth spreading across the university as much as I'm able to do so. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background, give you a little bit of what we're doing right now. The major research of this project, so just so you know, is in year three and we're just launching year one. So it's very teaching oriented at first, but I do hope it becomes um, it blossoms, you know, in a really comfortable way uh, into a research project by the third year in a more comfortable way than the than this year the pandemic really was an interesting time to be launching a student media lab for over 100 students in a classroom that is what we did first the large gen ed esoc 150b which is called social media and ourselves um, we transformed that beginning in fall of this year beginning in august into a student media lab where they're using Adobe Premiere Pro, they're using Adobe Illustrator. I'm gonna give you the lowdown a little bit about who's teaching them and how we're going about that. But we're essentially, that's one of the kind of gateways through which we are producing student stories about technologies, students' experiences with technologies in order to kind of up our game in our classrooms, okay? Um, we are also using the student stories in Humans Our Social Media. This is an open educational resource textbook that students contribute to. Then there's the Social Media and Ourselves podcast. This was a pilot project leading toward this. We've got a couple different stories currently produced and a few more coming. Um, and these use student voices and their experiences with technologies. Um, and sometimes conversations with scholars as well about them, about what is it that we're learning from these stories that scholars don't already know about new media and, and its use and behaviors. Um, there's also a collection of student stories to be um, hopefully integrated into the uh, campus repository in the next year or two. I'm in conversation with them. Um, and then the research again is in 2023 to 2024. And all of this also is with in coordination with a great community of scholars an interdisciplinary community of, of those who teach and research technologies here at the university. So um, iVoices essentially starts from the premise that there's a problem in how we teach about technologies, um, that we're leaving student perspectives out. And students are not blank slates. When they walk into our classrooms, they already have experiences with technologies. Um, and this is not about being a digital native or anything like that. This is much more about how they've learned particularly to navigate, depending on who they are, who their family is, what culture they come from what worlds they've kind of moved through. That is knowledge and literacy uh, that they come into our classrooms with. Um, and if we can integrate that into our classrooms, we can really connect with students and we can increase student efficacy. Um, on the other hand, if we don't integrate that into our classrooms, if we walk, if they walk in and we treat them as though they're blank slates um, and though they're and as though tech knowledge is some kind of linear path and the teachers at the end of it and they're at the beginning, well, then they they leave that classroom feeling like they learn like they know less than when they walked into that classroom. So what we're doing in iVoices is acknowledging that personal and cultural knowledge matters and particularly the funds of knowledge that students come into their studies with. Um, there's great research on this um, called funds of knowledge that I have linked at the bottom of the page that I'm looking at right now and that is linked in the chat. Um, and so these funds of knowledge really can enrich our classrooms if we choose to tap into them and turn them into curriculum in our classrooms. And so I'm doing this um, with a great team of people in the iVoices Student Media Lab centers um, by teaching students to tell their stories and produce media out of them. Um, so I'm doing this, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit so you can see who it is that's helping me because this would be nothing without the incredible team that I have. These are our student media lab workers. We're hiring two per semester for four semesters. And so we call them the two, four, six, eight. Um, this is Lisette and Maria. Uh, they've been teaching the students already this semester and producing their own stories. And we've had wonderful feedback from the students in some initial um, focus groups and, and other kinds of evaluation that we've done so far. 
Um, I'm working with, of course, the students. We've got 150 students, and so we call them the 150-150 because it's eSociety 150B and it's 150 students. Their voices have been excellent to integrate into, um, into our classroom this semester, and this is just the beginning. We've got wonderful graduate teachers working with us. Um, this is Alexandria Fripp and Sam Wynn. They are both in the School of Information and they are spectacular helpers for me and partners in this endeavor. Um, our artists and production partners so far, we are working with the UA libraries, particularly Cheryl Culier has been amazing in helping us integrate our content into press books um, in order to be an open educational resource uh, and to integrate student content over time. She's been amazing and so have digital learning. We have a lot of partners there. Luis Carrion has been um, excellent in helping us and in supporting in the students in what they know and what they can then teach our students in the classroom. Um, and then we have a great interdisciplinary community of scholars, Brian Carter of Africana Studies um, and other uh, relationships as well, Amy Fountain of Linguistics, Victor Breitberg of Anthropology, Stephen Rains of Communication, Anna Leach here from the School of Information, and Shelley Staples, who's not pictured. And we've got interns we're working with, including I have a lot of um, Master of Library and Information Science interns coming on board in the spring. I've been blessed, I'm sorry to say, just in this regard, by the pandemic, because I think having a virtual internship that's interesting and that that has human connection involved has really gotten the master's students excited and i'm very very excited to work with them our master's students in the school of information are spectacular so um right now we also have chris kelly who's an excellent e-society intern and has an amazing story coming out and we have taylor robeson who's not pictured who is a current um intern who will also have a great story coming out soon so um we're changing the face of inquiry is what I like to think because we are using student experiences to help us understand things and kind of move a little more quickly through the world of research, um, which can go at a very slow pace. Here are our research questions. If you wanna click on that link and read them on your own, I know I'm almost out of time, um, but it's just been really an honor to be, uh, to, to be supported by the university and by our college and by this department in particular in this research please talk to me about it and let me know if you'd like to be involved. Great, thank you, Dr. Daly. Any um, questions, please go ahead. Can I ask the first question? So yes. Diana, um, it will, will the outcome of this project be a set of recommendations? Because I think I would love to hear. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. There will certainly be a set of recommendations. There will also be related to the open educational research, resource and press books. There will be some resources that you can integrate into your classrooms, including um, also we have on Adobe Education Exchange right now, and we will have more lesson plans that you can integrate into your classroom, either if you're going to be producing media or at least just to tap into students' knowledge in you know, simpler ways. Um, but that's a really good question. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for yeah. listening. Yeah, if there aren't any more questions. Uh, Dr. Bikra, you're up next. Okay. So I hope you can hear me well and you can see my screen. Um, I'll be talking today about my work as a data scientist, as a language used researcher. I will, be, I, will be, I will be addressing three aspects of my work in this short presentation. I'll provide you to provide you with a general overview of what I do. I'll be talking about building learner corpora, developing uh, tools for language teaching, and um, tools for the notation of corpora. So starting with building corpora, just a quick definition so we are all on the same page. A corpus is a collection of documents or texts. I've been involved in building two learner corpora, Crow uh, and Macaws. Crow contains university level um, first year academic writing assignments in English from three institutions. Uh, the main PI for this project, project is Dr. Shelley Staples in the English department here at University of Arizona. Uh, we now have more than 10,000 texts uh, and 10 million words uh, in Crow. I've been also involved uh, with Macaws, which contains assignments from university level foreign language courses here at the University of Arizona, including the data collected uh, for my dissertation. 
We currently have two learner languages presented in this corpus, Portuguese and Russian, totaling over 600,000 words. Uh, for an example of the type of research I do with this type of data, uh, you can check one of my recent publications uh, on language used by L3 Portuguese uh, learners. So regarding corpus building, uh, my main role for these projects is to build and standardize um, the data processing workflow, automating as many of these processes as possible. This processing pipeline is ongoing. It's not a one-time thing. We collect data every semester from students. So we need a replicable processing pipeline that takes into account previous data. I also design and build interactive interfaces for any processes that cannot be automated. Uh, finally, I train and mentor graduate and undergraduate students in these processes. We start with uh, all types of files, PDFs, Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, with all, which are um, student assignments. Uh, we also have information about the students who produce these assignments, like register data, Qualtrics surveys, and so on. Uh, the first Python script I created was to ensure all files were encoded in ETF-8 uh, while actually playing ASCII for English and ETF-8 for other languages. Uh, I also attempt to standardize punctuation for reading assignments um, just to make sure that all of these are machine readable. Then we add metadata to each individual text file in the corpus uh, and the metadata is also used to automatically de-identify the texts uh, because these are going to be shared publicly. The final step is to manually identify some of the texts that we know contain personal information that will not be in the metadata, like names of family members and friends. Uh, I created an, an interactive interface for this manual process to help humans with this task, task and minimize human error. I'll be talking more about these, uh, these interfaces uh, in a minute. Uh, so the public derivables for these processes are the online and offline corporate, of course, and Chabata which is an ongoing project to refactor Python scripts for more general use, in addition to organizing a wiki to explain all of these steps. Uh, the next step we are working on is annotating the files at word level with part of speech uh, labels and possibly dependency labels. Um, if you want to learn more about how we're going about the deciding which annotator or parser to use, I have an upcoming publication in press on the topic of the automated annotation of learner data, uh, which has some issues that is not usually uh, present in other types of data. So regarding teaching tools, the online corpora are designed to be used for teaching, uh, but in addition to offering the online platform for corpus searches, we also uh, have IDDL, which is Interactive Data Driven Learning. So the idea of data-driven learning uh, is to incorporate authentic examples of language use into language learning materials, usually in the format of concordance lines, and I'm gonna show you some examples in a minute. Um, the purpose of DDL is to elicit pattern noticing in language learners, which has been shown to help in language acquisition. Uh, so I create an interactive option for, for DDL and uh, by creating an embed button in the corpus, the online platform for both Crow and Macaws, this embed option creates an iframe that can be then uh, embedded into Google Sites or course management systems. Um, here are the concordance lines. Uh, so the embedding shows the concordance lines with search terms centered in each context, uh, and the students can scroll up and down and sort the lines in different ways. Uh, this tool is currently being used to create learning materials in English, Portuguese, and Russian, and we are evaluating it for usability. The last topic I would like to touch on is annotation tools. I've already mentioned the interactive user interface that I created for the manual identification of texts, um, but I've also created tools for hand checking automatic annotation, such as part of speech labels and dependency labels with the purpose of calculating and precision and recall for these. Um, like I mentioned, I have a paper in press that reports on that work. Uh, I will focus here today on interactive user interfaces for human annotation instead, instead of automated annotation, actually aiding humans uh, for annotating texts. Um, so citation practices in academic English is a common topic of research in writing studies. Uh, in fact, my colleagues and I at Crow worked on a project last year to investigate citation practices of novice academic writings, uh, academic English writers. Uh, in that previous project, there were four to five of us humans annotating each sentence in our data for citation form and citation function. We ended up with over 5,000 labeled sentences. Uh, there's been research 
on identifying and labeling in-text citations automatically. But there's a number of problems when it comes to automatic identification of citations of novice writing. Um, so in addition, there is also the problem of coding schema not being shared and standardized ac across different research groups. There is a lack of transparency as well uh, in terms of the coding schema. So here's what one of the interfaces looks like for coding citation form. Um, so the interface, it's again, it's to, hate, uh, to aid humans into uh, coding these for form. And then the interface uh, is built on the classifier that I built on previous data classified by humans. And it provides uh, information about machine prediction probabilities for each one of these labels. Um, there is also another part of this interface where humans are trained on, um, on the schema. And then because that part of the interface is based on sentences that have been coded by uh, humans, they get feedback. So after the training, they go on to this interface that is actually to uh, code new data. So data that has never been um, coded by humans, right? So it's just the machine providing some of the the guesses, but hum the human is the one who decides. That's what I had for today as an overview. Thank you so much. Uh, and here's my contact information and my um, website. And how do I stop sharing? Oh, here it is. I switched things around. Great, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Anna. Dr. Picoral, did you say that you have a publication about this coming out soon? Uh, yes, uh, so it's, if you go to my website, I list all my publications there. For oh, the beautiful. citation class, yeah, and for the citation classifier, I'm submitting something soon. Awesome, thank you. Okay, there aren't any more questions. Dr. Dr. C, you're up. Okay, share a screen and uh, where's my, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about author-driven phenotypical data and the ontology production. And we started this project a couple of years ago. Last year, I talked about lots of ongoing work and this year I will be able to report some of the results. So the problem we're trying to address, address is there's lots of phenotypical information has been published they're very much needed for evolutionary biology research, medical sciences, taxonomical research, um, and related other researches. However, the problem is unlike genomic data, phenotypic information are typically published as natural language in academic um, uh, journals with less structured and buried in publications, and it's not there. It's not findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, or reusable. Um, the major challenge here is that we need lots of concept normalization steps to matching the keywords to formal terms using, used in ontologies. For example, we have examples like sculpture being weak. What does weak mean? Is it you know, reduced in size or poorly developed? What does reduce mean? Um, so there are two general approaches people have been taking to address this problem to get the data into the, the format that a computer can use. One is to impose structure at the time of the information creation. Um, the second uh, more popular approach at this time is post-publication curation by professionals. Both approaches has difficulties. The first approach impose constraints so the user cannot freely express themselves. They have to choose from a set of given words. Um, the second approach has is burdened with inter-curator variation. It's up to even more um, than 40%. And also curation result does not always accurately reflect, reflect the author's original um, intention. So this, in this project, what we are trying to do is to find the middle ground. We're trying to investigate the feasibility of using author curation. We believe that author has the authority, author understands what they're writing. So we want to uh, remove intercurator variation by um, enabling authors, um, provide authors with software platform tools to allow them to actually express themselves. We also want to remove those constraints. We want the author to be able to really express themselves. So some of the results that we have um, so far, uh, we did attitude survey. 
um, the survey shows that um, many um, authors, um, phenotypical authors, are frustrated with ambiguities in the phenotypical publications. A lot of them are aware, aware of the intercurator variation problem. And the vast majority of them believe authors are the best at maintaining accuracy in the curation process. So we ask if we develop a tools, how much extra effort you're willing to put to use, to learn to use these new tools and, and to make your data more computable. And the data show here, as you can tell, even though around one fifth of the um, respondents are willing to put more than 20% of effort, but in order to capture, get most authors on board, we need to actually develop a very easy software so that um, it will incur less than 5% of effort. So based, uh, yes, we also, the data, the survey data allow us to construct models to understand um, people's awareness of the problem, how it's um, negatively related to their resistance to um, uh, changes and, uh, and uh, um, the awareness of the problem help them to adopt, to provide motivation for them to adopt the solutions. Um, so one of the first um, prototypes that we created is my measurement recorder, and we did a usability study. Um, this measurement recorder addressed the problem of, of numerical characters. One character can be measured, the length of uh, perigenium beat can be measured in so many different ways. And if you don't actually define this, uh, recording any data would not be meaningful. So we let the user to first to define this, and then we can uh, actually allow them to enter data for those characters. And those characters can be shared by all the users. Our findings show that this tool allows us to actually reduce the character variation by 48%. Um, we also discovered that using illustration like this alone does not help much. We need ontological definitions as well to help the user to understand how generalizable one definition is. Uh, we assessed the time spent um, by the, a new user. We found that most new users can figure out how to use a measurement recorder within five minutes. Um, so when we allow authors to add terms to ontologies, we certainly need to find a tool or to um, um, an easy to use tool to allow the user to, to add terms without adding burdens. So we again assessed four different tools and we, we assessed the effectiveness the effectiveness of the tools, efficiency of the tools, and the user confidence in terms of using the tools. We found that the quick form is the most efficient and the wizard is the most effective. And Web Prodigy, to our surprise, actually were way better uh, accepted by the, the novice users than we had expected because Web Prodigy was actually designed for ontology engineer. Another surprise that we actually found is Wikidata. We thought Wiki was actually a user-friendly interface, but it's, it scored really low in all three regards. So we actually um, used QuickForm and Wizard in different of this entire system. Um, so as you can see, if we put everything together, this is going to look like, like this. So we have the editors, like the measurement recorder, and the user, in order to express themselves, they need to add terms to the ontology. When you allow many, many users to add ontologies freely, then there's bound conflicts. So we need to actually to help the user to, um, to resolve their conflicts. So we developed a, a mobile app that allows the user to uh, get to a consensus, discuss the terms that they have used and how they're vary, and we hope to encourage consensus in the end. Um, so building on what we have, we expanded on the measurement recorder. We made a character recorder that taking care of not only numerical measurements, but also categorical measurements. Our final um, plan for this um, year and the coming year when the vaccine is available, we will start to perform usability studies and real case studies to assess what kind of conflict we get and uh, effective the resolver is going to be. So that is the whole thing, um, resolve, make the phenotypical data because everything in this, um, once it's linked to the ontology data, the semantics is clear and everything is export, exported as RDF graphs with each every piece of information identified with a unique ID. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you um, for the organizers. This is a great event. Thank you. Okay. Uh Dr. Leisha Katz is up next.
Hello, everyone. Let's see if I get my slides up and running here. Thanks for coming out this full Friday afternoon. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Um, Zach Lisher Katz, assistant professor here at the I School. And uh, this is my first research blitz, so I'm excited to get uh, involved here. I want to first ask, um, raise a question, what is visual information? And typically we think about, uh, we've seen a lot of studies on objective models of vision and perception that try to describe vision in terms of physical and cognitive capabilities of our bodies. Think about cognitive science and areas that use controlled lab experiments to study vision itself. Uh, my work looks more at uh, visual information conceived of in terms of how people engage with uh, various visual artifacts or visual phenomena and form knowledge from that. So we can think about meteorologists working uh, in a meteorology uh, environment there, drawing information from radar, from other types of images, looking at the sky to form knowledge. Think about collections of natural history materials, uh, entomologists working with a collection of butterfly specimens, or even in everyday life, organizing your family's uh, photography collections and things like that. So visual information is involved and runs throughout all human activities, I think. And I, I, try, to, I try to break it up into this thinking about vision as the study of cognitive and perceptual capabilities uh, and visuality, where we look at the cultural, historical, institutional, and conventional ways of seeing and creating meaning through visual materials. So I look more at the visuality side and draw from theories from media studies and sociology of knowledge and science and te technology studies. Also, I want to point out vision is always embodied and integrates knowledge from all of our senses uh, and also um, is influenced by language. So linguistic, uh, the, the uh, carving of colors and, and shapes the way in which we perceive colors using different terms and things like that. And this embodied dimension is really interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about this later uh, in relation to virtual reality. So think about the visual in relation to the other perceptual uh, aspects of the body as we think about immersive media that's uh, emerging today. So in terms of visual information, in my research, I look at uh, three areas. I look at artifacts, so physical um, and digital uh, media, analog media, institutions, so archives, museums, and libraries where these materials are stored and preserved and accessed, and also practices of how people create, curate, and preserve visual materials. So I look at those three different aspects. Uh, just going back to what is digital curation? You know, um, I like to pull from the Digital Curation Center definitions and their model. They have a very nice diagram, looks kind of like a bullseye, which uh, may or may not be a good idea, but um, they define digital curation in terms of maintaining and adding value to a trusted body of digital information for current and future use. use. And the term embraces digital preservation, data curation, and the management of assets over their life cycle. And I think life cycle is an important term here where we see the sort of cyclical um, design or, or cyclical model where information is created and received, appraised, selected, ingested into preservation repositories, stored, accessed, used, reused, transformed, and it goes through the cycle again. And, and I focus in my current project looking at the creation uh, aspects of that uh, cycle, as well as access, use, and reuse, and transformation. So uh, my dissertation work, I looked at transformation in terms of digital um, reformatting, so digitization of analog collections. So uh, I like this model because it gives us a, a way of thinking, uh, carving up the, the intellectual space and focusing on particular areas. So the current project that I'm working on right now, uh, we just submitted, uh, I think about two months ago, a pre-proposal to the Institute for Museum and Library Services to fund this project. We're still waiting to hear back. And, and if we get the go ahead, we'll have until March to get the full proposal in. Uh, it's called 3D Research Data Curation Framework and it's a partnership with Harvard Library. It builds on an early, earlier project I was involved with in, um, during my postdoc at University of Oklahoma. We partnered with Virginia Tech and Indiana University on the Lib 3D VR project. We brought together researchers in the areas of 3D and VR, as well as digital curation and academic libraries to talk about the problems and possibilities of using 3D and, and virtual reality in academic libraries. 
And from these forums, we were able to identify a set of uh, digital curation challenges uh, that needed to be addressed. And you can check out, um, I'll make these slides. I can, if anyone's interested, I can send you the slides. Uh, and there's a link to that project. And we also pull from this project that we had funded through the Council on Library Information Resources in 2018 to 2019. Similarly, we brought together researchers and library practitioners together to talk about the uh, curation challenges of 3D and VR projects in libraries. And we put out this clear report uh, in, in February of 2019, which summarizes the, the talks from the symposium. So the, the concern, the main question of this project is how do researchers create and curate their 3D data? And the goal, uh, one of the outcomes from the project is to design a 3D curation uh, toolkit, which will include workflows as well as uh, guidelines for researchers across disciplines. We employ quality, qualitative methods, interviews, participant observation, some document analysis. And right now the plan is to recruit eight research labs. We have a few already, we've been talking to some plant scientists here at U of A, and then we have some biologists at UMass, and, and we even have some humanists who are using 3D data. Uh, we have a, a professor at University of Oklahoma who's doing 3D scans of medieval manuscript pages. So just trying to think about the different disciplinary needs for this type of uh, 3D data creation and curation, but also different techniques that they're using. Uh, so there's some practical implications we're hoping will come from this, supporting 3D data reuse across disciplines and supporting immersive visualization techniques throughout the research life cycle, you know, understanding where um, 3D data needs to be um, transformed or curated in different ways to support advanced visualization techniques. And we're also hoping to understand the role of 3D visual information in the construction of scientific knowledge and scholarly knowledge. And uh, this picture at the bottom is from the Digital Life 3D project at um, one of our partners at UMass, Amherst. And they've created this rig where they, they, do, they take um, hundreds of still images simultaneously around this uh, living, living creature. It looks like a snake of some sort. And this, this allows them to create rich 3D models. Uh, so that, that project, we're, we're hopefully we'll get it funded and we'll start in the fall of 2021. Uh, just a final word I'll say, shameless plug for my graduate seminar for next semester. But if any of grad students out there are still looking to fill out their uh, course list, um, I have this class, Art, Media, Knowledge, you should consider taking, Visual Epistemology is the Age of Immersive Computing. And the seminar will develop a critical framework for engaging with current trends in art, media, and information technologies and their impact on human knowledge. So um, I'll stop there and see if I, people, uh, my great audience here has any questions. Thanks everyone. And I'll put my uh, information in the chat too. So have that. And I guess I need to stop sharing. Oops. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Um, I do. So um, I'm actually going to talk about 3D data shortly because I make 3D models as well. And one of the issues that I've come across, and I don't know if this is something that you guys have talked a lot about or if you've thought a lot about, is different museums have different understandings of what a 3D model is and have way different ideas of what is an acceptable use of that 3D model. So I have to like really play around with museum rules, especially since a lot of times they will neither write them down nor tell me in advance, but will get mad at me later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we haven't actually looked at the rules. I mean, we found uh, we were talking when I was at Oklahoma. We were we we're trying to connect with our Museum of Natural History, and depending on who was in charge, we would get more or less access to doing three D uh, sort of photogrammetry scanning of their collections. So, definitely think there are differences of opinion about uh, not just. Um, not just the value, I guess the value of it, like, is this worth time, our time to allow our collections to be scanned? Um, was one question. And then, yeah, um, I haven't seen too much about the policies. I think, I think that collection, they weren't even at that point yet. Um, but that's, that's an interesting, that would be a great project to add on to this. Thanks, Megan. I have seen, um, I know a couple of museums actually have like, lists of people who are allowed to access different fossils in turn so like this is mostly with dinosaurs so it doesn't really affect me but like 
Thomas Carr gets the first shot at the T-Rex and he gets two years. So if someone builds a 3D model, it can't be accessible to anybody but Thomas Carr until the museum decides that it can be. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but, That's really cool. That's yeah. <laughs> well, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, I want to research that. I want to figure out what's going on there. It's like, you know, yeah, sort we of this. Talk about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. I have a lot of Thanks, Megan. Though, on 3D models. Awesome. Well, this is great. We should we should definitely talk. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, Dr. Burleson, you're next. Great. Thank you. Wynn Burleson here. I'm the Associate Director of the iSchool and the Director for Research. So I'm particularly excited about today and the Blitz and seeing all this research. I encourage everybody who's the uh, either presenting, listening, wanting to get engaged in any of this research, reach out to any of us. Um, and if you need to contact, connect with anyone, um, feel free to reach out to me as well. My email is win at arizona.edu. So very simple, W-I-N. Um, so I also have a joint appointment in the School of Health Science Design, a new unit in health sciences that's looking at transfer design across the university. And today I'd like to share with you human-centered design technologies and this large-scale instrument that we got the privilege from NSF to develop, which is the UA Holodeck, an integration of a lot of mixed and extended reality technologies. So uh, three main themes to the quick overview to my research. Uh, as an expert in learning sciences and human-computer interaction, I've been working for a couple of decades on affective learning companions, peer agents on screen that could help the individuals in their learning. Uh, I'll also talk about teams and creativity today, and then the large scale experiential supercomputing or UA holodeck. So the peer learning companions, um, here is an example of the kinds of uh, experiences that we wanna provide in terms of one-on-one -on -one individuals uh, sharing empathetic relationships, um, understanding people's emotion and how to respond with excitement. For example, uh, not being excited just because you've solved a problem, but relative to how much effort or frustration or um, engagement you had with that problem. If you, for example, share excitement uh, saying, oh, that's great, you did a good job on that work. Uh, prematurely, when an individual hasn't really put much effort, that can actually be a detrimental experience in their learning and it can teach them that um, you know, learning is supposed to be too easy or um, not to rise to the challenge of hard tasks. So we integrate different sciences, um, educational science, psychology, um, as well as here, you'll see a number of sensors. We take uh, sensors ranging from the posture sensor of a chair with uh, sensor pads to skin conductance. Here you see the wrist sensor with measuring skin conductance. The pressure mouse, if you squeeze the mouse, it'll uh, sense that you're putting pressure and agitation into the mouse, um, detecting elements of your frustration potentially. And then facial expression or eye pupil dilation with the camera. So here's some examples. Um, you can mirror facial expression, you can mirror um, smiles, mouth fidgets, and that can create greater levels of empathy and uh, involvement between an on-screen character and an, and an individual learner. Uh, this also involves design research. So how do you build these sensors and how do you get them to be acceptable and comfortable? So here's a quick picture of the design. And then the integration of all those sensors and capacities into one overall system. Uh, here you see an image with several of the sensors, the character engine, the behavior engine, the inference engine, all of that working at one time. And the kinds of things that we can show when we do all this research is um, we can detect gaming behaviors where learners are uh, sort of gaming the system. They're trying to get a answer from the help desk. Uh, they keep asking hints uh, and they go all the way to trying to get the answer from the hints as opposed to trying to do the work themselves. Uh, we can also understand yes moments when people are particularly excited and, and um, when we should celebrate their great success. So, yes, that was hard. I did it. You know, and so that would be a great time for this character to be really excited about the work that we've done. We've looked at how to support um, people with learning disabilities and low achieving students in particular, and they seem to benefit particularly from this kind of research in terms of uh, having one on one attention. Uh, it's they often get lost in larger classroom settings, group settings. And so we've also shown that we can do this work at scale. We can do this uh, with 25 computers in a classroom. We did that in 2009 with um, I guess about 50, um, sorry, uh, 200 sensors at the same time, uh, four sensors per station, and uh, showing that you could do active, um, um, accurate modeling of individual student emotion in a public school setting and a computer lab. Um, and so 
then uh, we've detected quitting and we've seen gender effects, differences between boys and girls and the kinds of information and support that they benefit from. So, um, here's a quick video. I don't know if you can see the video, but we, we've extended this um, into environments with human robot interaction and teams. These are children playing with a robot. Um, they can name the robot. They can create some of the behaviors of this pet like robot. And then we studied their interactions. How do they interact with each other? How do they interact with the robot? And what kinds of environments and programming and computational thinking do they explore and engage? And here you'll see one is the environment. So you see around the corners there, um, the uh, edge of the computing environment. And then just in time interactions, they're trying to show the robot a new instruction. And so those are just two of the kinds of things that you discover when you build these kinds of systems, just in time, uh, sequential, and environmental programming. We get them to build um, pets and environments for engagement and explore what kinds of learning outcomes they have here. And then we've even done uh, theater where we've had um, worked with theater groups and um, engaged in uh, different forms of technologies. Um, we look at teams and interactions in complex solving environments, um, both at the K-12 level and then also at the uh, graduate school level and across research institutes. How can you build a transdisciplinary robot astronaut mission simulator or astronaut robot mission simulator. And so how can we use environments here? You see the upper left, this was at Arizona State where I used to teach. Um, and this was a environment with um, a surround imagery and we created a lunar landing site for the Apollo 11 lunar, lunar landing site. We connected it to the JPL robots and uh, path planning from MIT. So this was a, a large scale transdisciplinary collaboration that leads into the kinds of how do you how do you understand teams as they solve problems? And here we analyze what phase of the problem solving uh, activity each individual on a team is engaged in, and how those uh, work together to create effective or ineffective. In you know what what predicts the effectiveness of a team, and um, what kinds of interventions can we provide to make teams more effective? We've done this also in labs over two week periods where we have individuals wear sensors and we model their creativity based on end of day surveys. Uh, and we can show that we can predict 90% of those um, indications um, through the machine learning uh, analysis of the face-to-face -face interactions and the motion interactions when they get up and move and talk to each other in those um, predict levels of creativity in those environments. Uh, and then we put sensors out in everyday environments. So we ask people, where would you like to put these sensors and how would you like them to mediate your lives? Uh, so we have built uh, end user smart homes and we've taken those to diverse populations ranging from uh, young adults, independent living and exploring how to actualize their own personal projects um, uh, to special needs, looking at how individuals, families with children and adult children with autism can use these kinds of um, scripts to create interventions that would maybe make them um, parts of their lives more effective or more streamlined, um, uh, helping them overcome some of the um, challenges that they have in their everyday lives. Um, so bringing all that together into the experiential supercomputer with the holodeck, what we're trying to do is look at this mixed reality environment. If we could bring everything into one place and make that available to researchers as kind of a, um, a, a research platform for research education or innovation. Could we enable individuals to do a kind of research that they might not be able to do if they didn't coordinate all this research and all this equipment in one place? So we're basically building a, a an experiential supercomputer. The paradigm of high performance computing has been that researchers would have access to a supercomputer, but in the social sciences and in um, experiences, we want to be able to both create these experiences in a holodeck but also to, um, to study these experiences. And so the kinds of experiences, this is the image again from Arizona State with the, the um, uh, decision theater where they get individuals and they can present the media. Uh, what we wanna do is look at individuals um, two or three, or in this case, six or seven, working with humans and robots. These are uh, virtual patients or robotic patients in a medical setting and there's a team and collaboration. So we're working with um, uh, Clay and Adar Adarsh and Clay on and um, Aztec here at U of A, Aztec's the Arizona Simulation Center, looking at how these teams can have greater and um, more effective communications and better training scenarios. So taking those same kinds of sensors for creativity and learning and putting them into these more diverse environments. Uh, again, here working with JPL and NASA on um, scientists that are either on a planet or would like to be on a planet and how they can be making better, more effective 
decisions about the kinds of things that they study and how they collaborate between humans and robots uh, to be more effective and to be more safe in these environments and to optimize scientific uh, output from these studies. All of this requires a lot of uh, collaboration. So these are just a, you know, most of the partners on the holodeck. Um, and then I just want to plug, uh, like um, Zach did, uh, a, a vertically integrated projects is a large scale program that we're starting here at U of A. Um, I'm teaching some of the first classes, but it's a way that you can engage students uh, semester after semester for their entire time here um, with faculty led long term research projects. So if you're interested in learning more about VIP, I'll share out um, in the chat our website and you can read about that. Um, you may want to start a team, uh, you may want to join a team. Um, those are all opportunities. And again, for VIP, you can connect with me as well. I'm not sure how much time that took, but hopefully less than the allotted. And again, win win at email or arizona.edu with or without the email. Great, thank you, Dr. Rosen. Um, any questions, please go ahead. So when, um, what's the status of Halodoc at U of A? Do you have a quick update? Yes, yes. Um, so the lab is being finalized um, as we speak. It should be opening in the spring, uh, mid, mid to late spring. Um, the, uh, we've received RII funding for developing it um, into a core unit, um, uh, core facility. So that's uh, discussions that are moving forward. And um, we, the holodeck team initiated at NYU is now um, gotten through the pre-proposal for an expedition. So U of A would be, uh, the expedition is the largest scale um, computer science grant in the NSF. And so if we're, eventually hopefully successful at that grant, then that would be another way to advance the, the holodeck further. Um, so those are some of the answers. Uh, I think, um, you know, for further more detailed answers, we can we can connect as well, Hong and anybody who wants to know more about the holodeck. Thank you, Wen. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Lee, you are up next. There we go. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Yeah, that's the thing about sharing screens and trying to juggle everything and like, wait a minute, how do I get out of this? So thank you all for being here. And thank you to um, Laura and Sarah for organizing and Diana Bailey for all of the help to organize all this too. Um, today I'm talking about community-based archives, considering the power of naming practices. And it's an IMLS funded uh, early career grant that started in, I believe it was July 1st of 2019, and it's a three-year grant. And the research is also being conducted with these amazing graduate research assistants. Uh, last year, I worked with Kristen Swaggy Booty, MALAS student, Knowledge River Scholar, and Samantha Montez, another MALAS graduate um, last spring, and also a Knowledge River Scholar. And then uh, this year I'm working with Ames Emsweiler, a doctoral student in the iSchool, and Bianca Elper, an MA student and Knowledge River Scholar. And so this work could not be what it is without their wonderful input. So I know Kristen's here, so thank you, Kristen, for all of your help on this. So here, again, community-based archives, uh, really thinking about the ways that communities create their own archives and here is a definition and it's understood you know as a as an archive that is substantially in control by communities and they're wanting to represent themselves through archival context and here are the archival partners that have been part of this research so far the south asian american digital archive or sada and they're an independent and autonomous archive and post-custodial digital community archives, and they've been around a while. Then we have the Houston Area Rainbow Collective History Group, which is an umbrella organization that brings together community, individual, and institutional archivists that are working on collecting LGBTQI plus uh, histories and then the Chicano Research Collection at Arizona State University, which is an institutional 
a collection and really a programming area that started in the 70s and that has expanded to work distinctly in and across marginalized communities and it's been uh, directed by Nancy Godoy, a Knowledge River alum from our university. And then the last one is the Arizona Queer Archives, which is the community-based archives that I founded back in 2008. And it's, an, it's considered a re research initiative through the Institute for LGBT Studies at the University of Arizona. And it was developed with the participatory ethos, so really working on uh, the collections being processed also with community members and it's become kind of like an archival, I would say like a kitchen sort of thing where we're creating and creating our own recipes and really thinking through the processing, what does a finding aid look like? Even though we have our standards that we are taught in archival studies curriculum, how do we look at it differently and really look at ways to understand where power is located in the work that we do as archivists? And uh, let's see, whoops, boy, this is just, okay. And I was planning on reading this, but I have all of these little, sorry, I'm just gonna do this there, hide that and play again. So these are the, the major research uh, questions for the research project. How are naming practices, those related to archival appraisal and description, understood, deployed, and importantly for this project, differently consequential for distinct communities? And the second, how can archival description practices be reimagined to account for the incommensurable in ontologies and epistemologies within and among communities? And the third, how can these reimagined practices be applicable across the spectrum of community-based archives to be relevant, to empower, and to respectfully establish new historical narratives from and about underrepresented communities? And with community archives, it's been relatively, like, I would say a young area of research and really following the lead of Andrew Flynn, Elizabeth Shepard and Mary Stevens out of uh, University of College London and their, their look at community archives across the UK was really helpful to kind of build this particular project. And then also to build on what Michelle, Professor Michelle Caswell from UCLA and her, her community archives laboratory, what they have been doing over the last like four to five years, really looking at what what do community archives do for the people whose collections they hold? Like what, what happens when you start to see yourself in history? And so I'm turning both of their projects now and building this project to really think about the practice of description and naming practices and what it does for representation. And in year one with Kristen and Samantha, we looked into the research into naming practices. And we did a closer look into Library of Congress authorities, subject headings, controlled vocabularies, and other descriptive standards. And then we were asking if archives use such a one-size-fits-all descriptive standard, how does this affect those peoples and communities that do not fit these standards? And in 2019, I attended the Archival Education Research Institute in, in Liverpool and there was an increased presence of UK archivists and specifically those who work in the black cultural, the black cultural archives there as well as indigenous archival studies scholars from Australia, Australia that were really talking about um, colonizing descriptive practices and thinking through the ways that if we're trying to even do like the more product less process like just adding you know, fast naming, fast description, fast appraisal, those sorts of things lack adequate or accurate description. And then they were considering these, these shortcuts and uh, basically as acts of violence against such underrepresented and those, those peoples who have been colonized. So, so that's one of the things we've been thinking about, like how does it affect people then and communities that don't fit the standards? And also in year one, we uh, used research methods that consisted of archival research, focus groups, individual uh, interviews to elicit conversations across diverse stakeholders. 
And these will be professional archivists, community archivists, and even those collecting their own personal archives. Like what does it look like and how do they understand even the definition of archive? Like how, anyway, these conversations have just been so amazing. And such dialogues then can flatten the hierarchies and make space for archivists and people from these non-dominant communities to share perspectives around naming, representation, and self-representation in the archives. And now in year two, we have um, our data. We're still finishing uh, one more focus group, no, two more focus groups and two individual interviews, uh, but we've been facilitating focus groups and interviews through Zoom. We were supposed to be traveling there to the different places, Philadelphia, Houston, Phoenix, we we're supposed to be traveling last uh, March and April, but with COVID, we had to switch into a Zoom uh, virtual platform. And we've been transcribing and coding and building this project code book to really look at the ways to analyze the distinctions across those that identify as community and those that identify as institutional sorts of archival context and better understanding the standards then or understandings of standards that circulate there. So what do descriptive practices look like and do across these contexts? So coming up the rest of this year, we'll be coding, analyzing, and then establishing our preliminary findings to present at a variety of conferences. We'll be publishing these preliminary findings in academic journals. And also we'll be creating in collaboration with each of the partner archives, uh, research br briefs that are centered on those specific communities and those specific um, areas of like archival appraisal and description practices and really thinking about the ways we can, as I put here, educate, agitate, inquire, and make change and really think about um, finishing with this aim to develop what might be understood as a set of archival best practices for working uh, with non-dominant communities to include cultural competencies, relational literacies, practical applications of theory in everyday archival work that is centered on identity, community formation, storytelling, collective memory, and the multiple roles that lived histories play in and for a, how a community understands itself. We're gonna try to look at ways to shift archival studies curriculum in ways that make community-based archives sites of enduring interrogation and spaces to study the effects of dynamic naming practices that do not necessarily have to fit prescribed institutional standards. And then lastly, we aim to create the community-based archives keywords and naming practices guide. And you can learn a little bit more here at the storytellingproject.io and that is all I have, thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Okay, uh, just for the sake of time, uh, Dr. Weatherill, you are up next. Great, so I'm gonna go through as quickly as I can, since I know we're running a little bit behind on time. Um, but essentially I'm talking about some research that I have done, which is best summed up as how to use math to really disappoint everyone you've ever worked with. Um, yay, that's one way to choose a research program. So the reason that I'm interested in understanding um, modern versus fossil animals um, is because specifically I'm interested in looking at this animal. So you might not have seen this animal before and it might not be very exciting looking to you. This is an oreodont. Um, I know that this doesn't look very cool, but that's because this is the basic model. Evolutionarily, they got a little bit more advanced. So there's some that were uh, living in trees, like little tree kangaroos. Uh, there are some that were maybe swimming, like little beavers. I know it's prancing, but it's prancing towards the water. Uh, there were some that were big and pig-like and were biting each other in the face, so leave huge scars on the bone. And then there's a bunch that have trunks. So I find this animal really interesting. There's a lot of evolutionary adaptations within this group, but nobody studies it. I'm very alone, <laughs> which is very sad. And it's not because there's not a ton of them. There are. Um, I don't know if you just saw the uh, some T-Rex fossils sold for like $30 million. Yeah, oreodonts sell for like 50 bucks. Uh, they are super, super common. They're often found, here's two different skulls uh, sitting on top of each other. The skulls in particular are super common because they are basically shaped like bowling balls. They're incredibly durable and hard to crush. So there's a lot of them. And they live for a long period of time. 
They actually live from like 50 million years ago to about 7 million years ago, and they're everywhere. They're all over the continents. Um, they even made it down to Panama, but not quite to South America. So the reason that Oreodonts are understudied is not actually because they're not common. It's because they're too common. So for example, here are 10 different skulls. These are all the underside. So you're looking at like the roof of their mouth. Here's all their little teethy bits. Here's all their other bits in the back of the skull. Um, you might decide that there were 10 species here. Currently, these are described as 10 species with three different genera, but a lot of them look really, really similar. <laughs> and you might change your answer depending on a couple of different pieces of information. So for example, what if I told you that uh, they all lived at the same time? Or if I told you that they're all found in the same state? And in fact, these are all from the John Day formation. So they're all found within about 10 miles of each other and about 1 million years of compressed time. Then all of a sudden, all of the differences that you see in these skulls might be a little bit more difficult to ascribe to different species. They have a lot of things in common. So to understand how many species there are, you kind of have to have a decent idea of how you would identify a modern animal if it didn't have all the cushy bits, right? Because Oreodonts are fossils, they lose all of their flesh. Fortunately, that would be really gross if they didn't. Um, so if you start with two camel skulls like this, obviously this is just a reflected image. So it's pretty clear that these are from the same species, but what if one was dramatically bigger than the other? What are the limitations on size within a single species? What about if these were compressed uh, as fossils often are? And so maybe one was taller and one was longer. These are real problems that we do see in the fossil record, but because we haven't quantified any of this stuff, looking at modern animals, it's really hard to come up with parameters that actually make sense. So a lot of my research has been coming up with parameters. And one of the animals that I use to do that is dikers. So dikers are a type of antelope. They live in Africa. They are very cute and weird. That little slit on the front of all of their faces, that is a scent gland. So they use that to mark their territory and you know communicate with other dikers. But the reason that dikers are case scenario is there's like 20 different species of them. They all live in the same area. So you get up to eight different species coexisting in the same chunk of forest. And even worse than that, they all do the same thing. They all really like to eat figs. Um, some of them like to eat figs that fall at night. Some like to eat figs that fall during the day. But ultimately, if you're all eating the same thing, you tend to have very similar looking skulls. And that is the case. When I first started doing this project, um, dikers, every time I would go and tell some museum collector that I wanted to look at their dikers, they would tell me, oh, great, could you identify any of them? Because if you don't already have any of that um, information, it can be really hard to identify them from skulls alone. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, I mean, they do all the same thing, they live in the same area, and they don't actually need to look very different to tell one another apart. Um, so unlike a lot of other animals, so like elk, for example, which have really big, extravagant antlers, dikers have really boring horns that don't look very different because they have this big hole in the front of their face where that scent gland sticks. Um, and so they use that for scent information. Um, this is not a picture of a diker, it's a picture of a munchak, but it's a more extreme example of that facial gland. Munchaks can actually turn their facial glands inside out to better wipe their stinky goop on things. So romantic. All right, so in order to look at all of this data, I've been doing a lot of photogrammetry and 3D modeling. If you're not familiar with 3D modeling with photogrammetry, you take a bunch of pictures really awkwardly, uh, and then you stitch them together in some sort of program. So here they are all stitched together. Um, then you have to make sure that you scale them appropriately as well, which is why they are half skulls. I found that uh, if you do, if you can't have them up on a podium um, because otherwise you don't have any scale information for them later. So it can be difficult to tell how big they were. Uh, but instead of taking a bunch of linear measurements on these particular things, I've been using landmarks. So landmarks are these little flag pointers here. Um, you can also see them kind of highlighted on the graphic on the right. I placed these in landmark editor. I smooshed the skulls together in DBLR. And then I analyze everything in R using the package Geomorph. And that gets you something that looks like this. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> um, it is way too much data 
there are a lot of landmarks there, which is great. It means that I can be measuring a whole bunch of stuff simultaneously to the extent where it's uh, entirely too much data. So people usually don't use just raw coordinates. Instead, it's very common to use principal components analysis, which takes all of those raw coordinates and digests them down into a couple of combined features that are a little easier to use. Ideally, this will look something like this, where you have all of one species up in a quadrant and all of another species down in a lower quadrant. Uh, it almost never does, but you, know, you can always hope for the best. So I did principal components analysis and I used it to tell me what were the most important landmarks. So what is the most important thing on each one of these skulls to try and basically see if they are actually different. So the most different of the many of those little dots are these ones. Um, they're almost all X coordinates. So each landmark, because it's 3D modeling, it has an X, Y, and a Z component. Um, and almost always it was the X. So the width of the skull was really important. The one uh, component that was different was the orbits. That would be the Z. So <laughs> how far forward the, the eye socket is, I guess, is important in diagnosing diker skulls. Some have squishy faces and some have longer faces. Um, so I took these coordinates and I did a variety of statistics on them, including a, a bunch of different tippy tests. And I found that by and large, um, some of these taxa are distinguishable from each other and others are not. So anything that's in red, you can't tell apart from each other. It's not statistically different. Uh, anything that is green with the little asterisks, you can. Um, I also did some um, classification models. So random forest analysis, discriminant function analysis, tried some neural networks as well, just to see if maybe we could actually classify these things. Um, and you can, but it's picking up the exact same problem. So it can classify some of them really well and others of them not. Mostly it can pick out the really big ones and the really small ones. And anything that was medium sized is uh, smooshed all together in the middle. Um, and part of the reason is because it appears that there's some convergent evolution happening in dikers. So these are the family tree kind of stretched out along those axes. What you want to see if all of these animals are evolving in different pathways is like uh, everything stretched as far away from each other as possible. What you don't want to see um, is like a cobweb because a cobweb means that all of these different things from different groups are evolving to the same shape, becoming very similar in shape. Um, and we do see a lot of that. It's not that the uh, that the pairs of dikers that were closely related were being confused for one another. Dikers that were super far apart from each other were more likely to be misdiagnosed as each other because they lived in the same area. So there's this weird geography thing, um, and that's really taxonomically scary for the fossil record. Because if you have these 10 different skulls, but they could be very distantly related and they're evolving to look exactly the same, uh, it's going to be really hard to tell how many species you have. Um, and these particular skulls, these are oreodonts. If you flip them over, they do have that little lacrimal fossa. So probably they do have the exact same problem as dikers do. And that is essentially one of many, many um, heartbreaking <laughs> math projects that I've been working on. I feel like my primary research body is just like, no, we can't. We're bad at it, which is a choice I made in grad school. So great. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, any questions, please go ahead. Okay, um, uh, I guess also for the sake of time, I will uh, go ahead and share the next uh, presentation just because uh, there were some scheduling conflicts. So they sent in a pre-recorded presentation. Um, it is Dr. Uh, Jensen. Um, let me see. Uh, Better? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, research are largely studying uh, natural language processing or NLP, um, specifically how we can teach computers to perform various kinds of inference with text. Uh, I'm presenting virtually because of COVID and pre recorded because we have a father at home. Uh, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, this is what I look like back when I had more hair, um, a lot more hair. Um, so my long-term interest uh, is in building artificial intelligence systems that can answer questions and provide sort of detailed human readable explanations for their answers. That's what a bunch of my research is about. Um, I'm particularly interested in systems that give 
explanations by combining lots of different facts from different sources. Uh, in systems that use a lot of common sense knowledge and explanations, uh, both of those problems are currently very hard. Uh, and I generally work across making data, tools, and other tasks. Um, I also generally work fairly broadly across NLP and AI. Um, here's some of my papers from 2020. Um, I have projects in building explanations, um, building a new kind of programming language for natural language uh, inference, uh, navigating virtual environments from text vectors, uh, as well as some more classic NLP tasks like name, entity recognition, and question classification. Um, I also co run a shared task, which is sort of like a worldwide competition um, in explanation centered uh, inference. Um, I'm going to chat about just a couple of these in sort of 60 seconds or less to give a broad overview. Um, so what is explanation-centered inference for question answering? Um, here's a question uh, and an answer and an explanation. So in this case, the question is, an animal has six legs. What's it most likely to be? This is one of the simpler questions from the standardized science exam for elementary students. Uh, here the answer is a fly, which of course is a kind of insect. And the task here is to find a series of interconnected facts from the knowledge base that provide a fairly complete explanation of why the answer is correct. Uh, here the explanation is a fly is a kind of insect, an insect has six legs, and an insect is a kind of animal. Um, but you know, sort of by the way, the it's kind of three fact explanation is sort of at the very limits of our abilities to propose an right now. Um, and these explanations, by the way, come from a large database of structured. Explanations that we don't really have knowledge from. Um, now, this sort of three fact explanation has a cartoon example of bits on a single slide. Um, this is a real link, um, which is another example of uh, explanation from the world tree corpus that contains a lot more facts. The question is which of the following characteristics would best help a tree survive the heat of a forest? And the answer here is thick bark. And so to answer this question, the central concepts that you need to understand are that bark is a protective covering around the tree, and that thick things tend to provide more protection than thin. But you also sort of need to know a lot more sort of detailed common sense or world knowledge that we often don't think about, like that protecting something means preventing harm, that fire causes harm to living things, that trees are a kind of living thing, that protecting living things help it survive and so on and so forth. Um, these are things that you and I know. And probably learned when we were very, very young, but computers that information. This sort of mix of science knowledge and detailed common sense or world knowledge, enough we sort of hope to make the explanations meaningful to a five-year-old, is sort of the hallmark of the detailed uh, explanations in uh, the work that I do. Uh, the explanation databases that we build are amenable to lots of different kinds of analysis and visualization. Here's just a pretty picture I'm mostly going to skip over that shows the similarity of different explanations. Um, and one of the main things that distinguishes my research from others is that I'm particularly interested in how we can combine very large amounts of information um, together to support inference and build these sort of large detailed explanations. Um, lately, we've been exploring how to represent sort of what we call common inference patterns as uh, reusable and executable graphs um, in the computer science sense. Uh, the one shown here expresses how changes of state of matter works, like melting or boiling or freezing, um, which are common in science exams. Uh, one of the funnest things I've been working on recently is designing a new kind of knowledge based hybrid programming language specific to solving multi fact natural language inference tasks. Um, this one was just published um, at the NLP, which is a large conference in natural language processing. Um, and for the computer science folks, this is essentially a hybrid imperative and declarative language, uh, partially based on constraint satisfaction and sort of like a knowledge based backend similar to SQL. Um, so you can do a lot of very powerful inference uh, with very little code. Um, as I sort of found out, it's very challenging to program in a sort of complex knowledge intensive programming paradigm that nobody else programs in. Um, and so I've also worked on generating supporting tooling, not just for this language, um, ideally, um, but generally for many of the things that I work on generating other tools. Uh, and there's a lot of human computer interaction. Um, here's an IDE that we made for this language that lets you not only keep track of the code, but also the backend ontology and view the sort of micro simulation outputs that the language generates. So it's a lot of fun. 
definitely have to make sure you had your coffee for the day before sitting down this one there's a lot you have to keep in your head. Um, and last, uh, one of the problems uh, with generating explanations is, say you generate a really convincing sounding explanation, how do you know that it's actually correct? Um, that's a problem that's discussed plenty in semantics and formal logic, but an alternate viewpoint from cognition, which is much of my background is in, is that humans make many simulations of the world in our heads to think about and verify things. Um, and so I'm sort of been lately getting uh, getting interested in virtual environments for that reason. Um, this paper that was just published um, uh, by the lab is on a vaguely related task. Um, given a natural language task directive here, wash the fork and put it away, these are common everyday tasks. You have to train a model that um, makes a virtual robotic agent uh, that can break down the task in a series of steps and then execute them in a virtual environment. Uh, this is called the Ask for Alfred Challenge. Um, and so the paper that we put out showed remarkably that you can actually do this vision plus language task without any vision, um, and that you can get it right in about a quarter of cases, um, which is cool and really sort of interesting. Um, this slide here is just sort of a funny little error to end on. Um, the robot Butler model that we trained to do this has a tendency of putting cutlery in sort of strange locations like the microwave. Um, so while it might do exactly what you ask half the time, the other half of the time it's sort of a pretty big fire hazard. You wouldn't want to actually use this, but that's how science goes. Um, so one of the great parts of working in NLP is that when something works, it's absolutely amazing. And when it doesn't work, the mistakes are usually really bad. So, uh, and with that, if students are interested, please uh, check out my work at cognitiveai.org and uh, get in touch. Thanks. Okay, great. I um, guess we don't have any questions for this. Um, next up, we have Dr. Loa. Uh, go ahead. Here we go. So my name is Berlin. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Arizona. As you know, I manage the Knowledge River program and you can follow us um, on the bird there at uh, at Knowledge River. So a little bit about me, most of my work goes into supporting and promoting inclusive practices in archives, libraries, and museums. But I also look at the greater uh, tascape of placemaking and collective memory keeping practices and dive into the impact of popular literature on our collective memory. But today I'm here to talk about um, Knowledge River and our work for equity, diversity, and inclusion in the library field. So we're gonna take a really brief look at the history of EDI and LAS education, and then talk about what KR is doing now and in the near future. Um, can I just get a thumbs up from everybody that you can see the slide and uh, like, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so uh, this is a lot of text on the screen and I apologize, but I'll try to be brief here. If you're not familiar with the Knowledge River program, this is it in a, in a snapshot. KR was founded here at the School of Information in 2001 by faculty of the library school. Students are recruited to the KR program to focus on EDI issues and services in LIS with specific attention to native and Latino communities. Um, historically, that's what we have focused on. KR partners with, uh, KR partners with um, organizations in the community like PCPL, Pima County Public Library, ASU, the Health Sciences Library, and others to provide practical learning experience for KR scholars through GA placements. So while students receive the benefits that you see listed here, they're also subject to greater responsibility and expectations. They're required to take a minimum of two courses that focus on cultural awareness or cultural, culturally specific library services. And they're also expected to develop and produce scholarship that advances the mission and goals of KR. There is a lot, did that? Yeah, okay. So there's a long history of um, efforts for EDI in LIS education. CARE was not the first program, we're not the last program, but we are one of the longest continually operating programs that focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So really briefly, in the late 1960s, partially in response to the civil rights activities of the time, ALA surveyed universities on quote unquote Negro graduates of MLAS programs and found that the numbers were not nearly equitable. So they established an ad hoc committee on opportunities for Negro students. I apologize for the use of the term Negro. This is the terminology that ALA was using at the time. This is the only minority group considered at the time. ALA was not looking at native or Latino communities or any other marginalized group. 
but that's okay. They were addressing a very real problem. So at around the same time, the De uh, Department of Ed recognized the gap in access to higher education for BIPOC communities and funds were allocated to universities to increase recruitment specifically of BIPOC students. So examples of these include programs at Berkeley, Chicago, Austin, and some others. Um, meanwhile, here at the University of Arizona, in the late 1960s, the School of Library Science was founded here uh, at the UA in the College of Education. And in 1971, the first graduating class was let loose on the field of librarianship. At the same time, a faculty member by the name of Dr. Trejo, who is a bilingual librarian originally from Mexico, who had also worked internationally in Venezuela and some other places, um, recognized a need in the Tucson community. So with a group of colleagues, he founded Reforma, an organization promoting materials and services for the Spanish speaking community. It's now a national organization. It's an affiliate of ALA and there are over 20 chapters across the US. Anyway, back to the uh, iSchool. In 1974, the iSchool was accredited by ALA and one year later, Trejo and some others created GLISA, the Graduate Library Institute for Spanish speaking Americans here at the library school. And five years later, the last cohort graduated. Trejo um, was not looking specifically at Native communities or Black communities, just as ALA was not looking at Native or Latino communities. And again, that's okay. He was addressing another very real problem. He recognized a lack of equity in access to information and services for a marginalized community. So very briefly, between 1980, when, Gleesa, when the last Gleesa cohort graduated, and 2001, uh, when CARE was founded, a lot was happening on the UA campus to increase ethnic diversity and access to higher education. As an example, uh, uh, programs such as the American Indian Studies Program was founded, Mexican American Studies, and African American Studies, of which I'm an alum, all started as small initiatives, and now two of them offer PhD options. So fast forward to 2001. Members of the School of Information faculty founded Knowledge River as a program to address Hispanic and Native American library and information um, issues, and specifically to recruit uh, Latino and Native American students for careers as librarians. The program was funded by IMLS for about the first 12 years or so in three separate rounds of funding. We celebrated the 10th anniversary of KR in 2011. And in 2021, so next year, we're gonna be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the iSchool, and we're also gonna be celebrating 20 years of Knowledge River. I don't wanna dwell, uh, I don't wanna drown you in numbers, so we're not gonna dwell on this slide for too long, but I just wanted to show the incremental shifts that are taking place over time in, LI, in uh, LIS education and public librarianship. So I didn't go all the way back to the 1960s, we don't have time for that today, but we can consider that what the ALA discovered in that 1960s ad hoc committee uh, was that less than 5% of LIS graduates were black. And here are our most recent numbers. So you can see that we're slowly nudging towards greater representation. And I have to note that maybe it's not completely fair to compare the DPE numbers to ALA since they're different studies, but these snapshots of where we are, these are uh, snapshots of where we are. And as of last week, I didn't have the updated ALA numbers yet. So here we are. Anyway, the point here is that these numbers don't yet reflect the communities that we actually serve in the US public. Uh, I have other statistics, but again, I don't want to drown you in numbers, so I'm just going to skip over that part. You can look those numbers up uh, on the U.S. Census and other reports. So there are a lot of people not represented on these charts, right? They're either misrepresented or underrepresented because we know that the census doesn't always reach people of color. We know that Native nations face challenges with access to resources, much less representation. But these are the tools that we're working with. So we'll just appreciate the work that has gone into these reports and use these to help inform our ongoing efforts. Um, so uh, we all know, we've all experienced it this year, 2020 took a turn in which we were forced into a deeper self-reflection as a nation. This isn't new. The struggle for equitable access to information and services has been ongoing. We know that library services were denied to Black and Mexican communities in our recent history as a country. There's no denying that. We know that services and resources to Native communities on and off reservations have been dismally lacking. This goes beyond libraries, it goes into the roots of our society, but we can focus on library services and make improvements in our own realm of practice. We've all heard it or said it at different times, knowledge is power. So power in the hands of the informed with a commitment to improve conditions in our society points to a better future for us all. Information is a right. 
And we as librarians and information professionals can commit to respond to the social, economic, and intellectual needs of all people. So why does diversity and inclusion matter? Because inequality largely stems from varying socioeconomic backgrounds. The determinants of socioeconomic status are primarily wealth and race. And unfortunately, this makes it one of the most, uh, one of the biggest factors impacting access to education and to information. So, uh, and you know, in addition to this, uh, you've probably heard this elsewhere or read it elsewhere, but I think it's important to point out that studies indicate that by preschool age, children already reveal stereotypes and negative behaviors towards those that they perceive as being different than themselves. These are learned attitudes, learned behaviors, and they're fostered by the views of parents, caregivers, educators, and peers and, and librarians, right? So they're also affected by social messages that we receive in our reading materials, in our um, uh, movies and music, et cetera. So all of these things that convey information about particular cultures. As librarians and information professionals, we can help people develop an understanding towards those that they perceive as quote unquote other. Because eventually those preschoolers, those school age children, the teenagers and our undergraduates become people like Nick. They become our police officers and have a huge impact on society. They become professors, they become librarians. So the earlier we start and the broader we approach these issues, the better it is for all of us, right? We can provide positive role models for cultural diverse people. We can facilitate acceptance of cultures different from our own and we can foster a global um, understanding and connection because when we lack access to an understanding of diversity, we miss an entire opportunity to learn how to function in a culturally pluralistic world. Um, so these charts here are some stats from 2019 and I'm gonna move on to the next slide really quickly. But before I do that, I just wanna ask one question. If 95% of libraries are offering summer reading programs to their community, to the youth in their community, but the majority of the librarians and materials are not representative of the community they serve, then what does that 95% really mean? Who is benefiting from that technology training, the homework assistance, and all the other great services that libraries are offering? So um, this year, I know I'm a, like a couple minutes over time already, so I'm gonna wrap this up really quickly. This year, uh, Knowledge River was awarded an IMLS Laura Bush 21st Century Libraries Grant to address the ongoing need for supporting ethnic diversity in LIS education and to examine how the KR program has been successful in achieving its goals at the iSchool. The grant is focused on three core objectives to move the program and the field forward in addressing these issues. Of note, we are expanding our recognition of BIPOC communities, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, and the intersectional identities for our future KR cohorts. So the first that I'll focus on and the others you can, you can just read along is to develop a qualitative survey of our KR alum of over 230 graduates who are working in the field of library and information sciences. We wanna gauge how KR has impacted their career, how they have impacted the field, and how they're impacting the communities that they're serving. And we're aiming to measure our success as well as any potential blind spots. So this is not just um, a measure of how many library, librarians we're putting out into the world, but also their social impact. So this is gonna help us determine um, not only what we're doing well, but what we can do to further impact the field. And then we'll you know, put this out in published, uh, published works, et cetera. Um, and then uh, part of that, of course, is recruiting and funding up to 15 students each academic year. And on that note, I just wanna end by reminding you that we're currently recruiting for cohort 20. Information is available on the iSchool webpage, on the Knowledge River webpage, and or of course, by contacting us at kriver at arizona.edu. Thank you for your time. Okay, we have another recorded presentation, um, also due to scheduling uh, conflicts. Uh, and I will press Hello, play. Everybody. My name is Jan Bosdi. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Information. My research area is mainly focusing on incompetent interaction in XR and in extended reality, including virtual reality, mixed reality, and organized reality. I'm focusing on the unique interaction techniques in incompetent interaction, 
memory, object vibration, and locomotion. Let me talk about one of our latest research projects called SPARK. It is spatial augmented reality system with tangible interactions. We have tested three interaction methods, tangible cube, controller, and hand gesture. In tangible cube interaction method, we have created a real tangible cube, and we use that in order to interact with virtual objects. The controller version is basically using controller provided by the augmented reality system. And finally, we have implemented a hand gesture system in order to move and rotate virtual objects in the virtual environment. Here in this slide, you can see our custom-made tangible cube. It's a 3D printed cube that lets us put the controller inside the cube so that we can use a magnetic tracking via controller. But that wasn't enough for us. The accuracy was improved by implementing image tracking as well on top of the magnetic track. Now I'm going to show a short video from the different interaction techniques that we tested in our research project. After completing the implementation of these three interaction techniques, we have done a pilot study with three participants. The data provided by that pilot study helped us to make necessary updates on those three interaction methods. And after that, we made a user study with 42 participants. We have done 18 subjects user study for this project. We have tested three different interaction methods with two tasks. Task one was about translation, and task two was about translation and rotation. We also checked different metrics like learning time, completion time, usability metrics, cyberspace metrics, preferences, and accuracy for all these three different interaction techniques. The results of this study show completion time and information time has significant differences between different techniques. You can see that completion time for gesture immediately is almost 23 seconds, whereas tangible cube and controller is around 9 seconds. And there is a significant difference between the gesture and the other two interactions. In the gesture technique, 
the sixth degree of freedom was implemented by creating four different gesture ranges. Three of them was for the rotation in three different axes, and the other one for translation in three axes. The requirement to complete the task with translation and rotation with the gesture interaction system was harder because the users were required to do these two operations separately. For the information time, you can see that the controller interaction technique required almost 34 seconds on average, whereas tangible cube was 15 and the gesture was almost 20 seconds. There is again a significant difference between these different interaction techniques, and the main differences was against the controller. The controller technique required more time to understand how to use compared to the tangible cube and the gesture interaction technique. This may show us that it is hard to understand the interaction technique using the controller with respect to the tangible cube and the gesture. So for the displacement distance data or the accuracy data, you can see that there is again a significant difference between three interaction techniques. The tangible cube has the largest displacement distance with 0.04 meters on average, whereas the controller and gesture had displacement distance of 0.01 meters on average. There is a significant difference between the tangible cube versus controller and gesture. You can see that the plot is showing the placements of the cubes with green dots. The green dots are very dispersed in the tangible cube, whereas for the controller and the hand gesture, they are very close to the center. We believe that this is due to the weight of the tangible cube, that people were avoiding to carry more than necessary. But with the controller and the hand gesture, there is no weight of the virtual components, so they were carrying the cube until the center of the mark position. Within the scope of this study, the future works could be the tangible user interface that have more complex forms than the very simple cube or higher weights than we have tested. It can also be in-air projections versus one-to-one -one projections on physical elements. And finally, high fidelity versus abstract hand gestures for the gesture interaction time. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me via rbuzz at izona.ed. Thanks for listening. Okay, great. Um, next up is Dr. Beathard. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Beathard. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm in the School of Information, and I do a bunch of uh, machine learning meets natural language processing research. Um, many of you may know me from taking my neural networks course. So hello, all of you. Uh, all right, I'll try to keep this short and sweet. So um, what do I do? I like to try to teach computers to read. And at a high level, this is what that looks like. You know, so you know that if I give a bunch of text to humans and say, uh, do something interesting with this text, like say, make a timeline, um, they can make beautiful timelines out of this, particularly this beautiful timeline down here that you can only barely see a little bit out of is from the Guardian where they, uh, this was back when uh, there was that, um, unrest in, in the Middle East, a um, uh, bunch of protests and stuff like that. And they have a beautiful interactive timeline for that, which involves all the locations and all the different things that happen at different times. What I would love to reach is the point where um, rather than people having to create such timelines by hand, the, the computer learns so much about the text that it can actually read the text and produce the same kind of timeline. So this is a form of translating text into a structured form. Um, and so the idea is that you would learn this H function that would somehow take that text and produce this. Uh, now, realistically, uh, I'm not a visualization person, so we're not actually trying to produce the visualization. Rather, we're trying to produce sort of the database structure underneath from which you could generate a visualization if you were visualization minded. So how do we go about actually doing this? Uh, the answer is that it, it almost always involves a, a bit of where humans, typically linguistically trained humans, 
walk through the text and identify the important things like the events, the locations, the times, um, whatever it happens to be that's necessary to be in a structure, puts the appropriate links to them. So for example, that the clashes uh, happened after the unrest, uh, that the clashes happened in Tunisia, et cetera, those kind of relations between things. And uh, once you have those annotations on the text, then you need to somehow translate all of that text into numbers uh, such that uh, the machine learning algorithms that we're gonna use can understand it. Because they don't work on words, they work on numbers. So I won't spend forever talking about this. There's a wide variety of ways of encoding text as numbers. There's a wide variety of ways of annotating things, but they all basically lead towards this final step, which is, we train a machine learning model based on the combination of the numeric representation of the text and these human annotations that tell the computer what are the kinds of things that we think we should be pulling out of this text. So I'll give two examples of, of this kind of thing. I do more in my uh, the rest of my research. Of course, by the rest of my research, I mean the work that all of my uh, graduate students do since I'm pretty sure I don't actually do anything myself. Um, this work uh, comes uh, from some work with undergraduates back at University of Alabama in Birmingham when I was there before. And then Dong Fang uh, and Egowitz did a, a ton of this work uh, as well once I came here. Um, so this is how do you understand time expressions when you see them in text? So the idea here is that if I see a, a piece of text that says something like Mondays and Fridays next January, what I really want to do, oh, I should change the date on this, should say January 2021. Uh, clearly, I'm, I'm already making uh, year mistakes, so I'm right on track like I am every year. Uh, what you'd like to do is say, this is the timeline of January 2021, and here are all the Mondays and Fridays, right? They're little intervals on the calendar, right? I could give you a calendar, you could highlight all the Mondays and Fridays. So we'd like the computer to be able to do the same thing too. So how do we do that? Well, as promised, we have linguists annotate what the text actually means. That means recognizing that the and here sort of means a union of all the Mondays and all the Fridays, and that there's some sort of next operator here that combines with January, and all of these things together will yield uh, those intervals that we saw just a moment ago. Once you have the annotated data, you uh, teach a machine learning algorithm to, uh, to recognize these in text. So this was the, the model that we had. Uh, this is the published model. Um, that we have a couple unpublished variants that are a little bit better, um, but they all have the same flavor that you feed in either the individual characters or maybe little pieces of the text uh, through a bunch of neural networks that recognize that parts of this text are a day of the week, parts of this text are a month of the year, et cetera. Um, there's another step there, which involves taking those recognized days a week and months of year and linking them together so that you get uh, some formal representation of the composition of the operators that are implied by the text. So the, the way we would read this expression here is that the translation of Mondays and Fridays in January is that you first take the union of Mondays and Fridays you take the January following whatever time the document was written at, and you take the intersection of those two things, and that's how you get those intervals. So just uh, to walk through that a little bit more, uh, you know, these are basically temp uh, these are uh, formally defined temporal operators. Uh, so you just stick in the intervals, right? So the first intervals here are all Mondays forever, all Fridays forever, and all Januarys forever, and the document time is whenever this was uttered, so today in this case. Uh, and then you just sort of walk through these operations one at a time. So if we take the union of Mondays and Fridays, we get all Mondays and all Fridays forever. If we ask for the January following this next, we'll get the one in 2020. Uh, and if we take the intersection of these two things, we get that same set of intervals that we saw at the beginning. So there were sort of three components to this, learn an interesting uh, neural network model, apply rules as necessary to, uh, to combine the bits of the neural network model into a logical form, and then apply temporal logic to, to get the output of that. Uh, and, and again, uh, this is, uh, if you're interested in any of this stuff, the first third of Dong Fang's thesis is all about this, and uh, his thesis will be in about 11 days, so do, do feel free to join us for that. Uh, just as one other example of this kind of work, uh, so learning to understand geographical expressions. So if you see something like San Jose is the largest city in Northern California, hopefully you're thinking of the San Jose in California and not the one in Costa Rica, which is the, the one that I've shown on the left. Right. So this is uh, basically ge geographical disambiguation. There are many different places called San Jose. You've got to figure out which one it means. So how do we do this? Well, again, we have some linguists or other trained people annotate the formal semantics here. So in this case, the formal semantics is there's a gigantic ontology of place names and they each have IDs. And so the ID that we care about, 5392171 is the one in California. Uh, in the California, we care about the one in the ontology numbered I332921. 
then again, we train a complex neural network model. This is actually a Vikas's work. Uh, again, we have a slightly better one than this that isn't published, but this was the one that was published with this work. Uh, that, uh, that basically scans the text and looks for things that are beginning of location or inside of location or outside. That finds the locations. And then we use an information retrieval model to match those locations up uh, with, uh, with uh, possible different resolutions to them. So is it the San Jose in Costa Rica or the one in the Philippines or the one in the United States? And a fairly simple machine learning re-ranker looks at a variety of different things here like uh, you know, what is the population, for example, so larger population is more likely, are there other words nearby? Um, uh, Zeyu has actually worked a little bit on different ways of approaching this machine learning re-ranker, um, but there's, there's clearly more work that could be done there as well. Uh, all right, so let me just briefly mention a couple interesting open challenges. So in time normalization, uh, it is still difficult to handle things that are really common in the clinical text that I often work with, things like three weeks post-op, because that, it is a period on the timeline, but you can't figure out what it means unless you know which operation they're referring to. And then there's fun things like flu season, which isn't like a literal season like spring or summer or fall. And there might be more than one of them, but it does happen every year. And so you'd sort of like to be able to, to roughly map out where that is. Um, harvest season is interesting because harvest depends on the crop that's being harvested and it clearly depends on what country you're in. So in some cases, you know, your harvest season might be in a totally different part of the year than the other one, depending on your northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, whether you have dry and wet seasons or actual like four season years with spring and summer and fall and winter. And then a cool uh, task that uh, Egoitz and Zeyu are working on right now is how can you figure out a, a, a geographical name from a description of the other parts? So if I want, if I didn't know the shape of Wen, uh, Wenatchee National Forest, um, but I did know the shape of the Cascade Range and Okanogan National Forest and Gifford Pinochet National Forest, could I infer it? And so the example here, this little green box is basically what Egowitz infers with his model as the location of Wenatchee National Forest, where the actual location you can see is a little bit more complicated than that. But this is the idea. Could you figure out from just the remaining descriptions uh, what the description of a particular piece is. And this is very interesting for some of the work that we do with um, uh, environmental policy documents, where you might be talking about a particular unnamed park because they haven't built it yet. All right, well, that's basically everything I had to talk about. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. I just figured I'd tell you it's Gifford Pinchot. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering how you'd say that. Thank you. I see you're surrounded by them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you just like highlighted every forest around my house. It's a little weird. <laughs> it is possible that Egowitz is actually tracking you, um, but I, I have to check with him on that note. So. Yeah. You got one actually right though, so good job. Yeah, you know, one out of four is not bad. Okay, great. That is all we have for now. Um, thank you all to the faculty for your cool, amazing, fun, hardworking research um, and work. Um, and uh, this is being recorded. So if you want to go back and kind of review what someone said or whatever, uh, you can look at that a little bit later. And um, I think that's about it. If um, Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for hosting this event, Laura. It, it has been really nice for us as faculty to just focus on what we're doing and not on hosting the Zoom and everything. You did a good job. Thank you. I was going to say the same thing. Thank you to your team for putting this together. <laughs> <laughs>